called What the U.S. Can Learn from China. And I encourage you to buy it after the event, and uh, she can sign copies. Anne Lee, I'll introduce first, is the author of the book. Please come in. Congratulations, first of all, on the book. Uh, let's, let's a round of applause. <laughs> That's quite a feat. So Anne is a senior fellow in our Deaners in, in, our, in Demos' Fellows Program. Uh, Anne is a Jill of all trades. She's done many things that really qualify her to write this book. By the way, she's lived here and in China. Anne has worked um, as a hedge fund partner. She's worked as an investment banker, but she's also worked as a professor here in the city, but also at Peking University. Anne earned her BA at uh, Cal Berkeley. She earned a graduate degree at Woody Woo, the Woodrow Wilson School of Public Affairs at Princeton, and she has an MBA from Harvard, which gives her a nice, unique uh, combination of credentials and just uh, great, great experience and insight. So that's Anne. And then we have Matthew Bishop, who Matthew Bishop is the U.S. business editor and New York bureau chief of The Economist. If you have uh, left of center friends who tease you about reading The Economist, just tell them it doesn't matter what it says. It's one of the best written weekly magazines being published, at least in my opinion. So Matthew is also the writer and author of a book called The Road from Ruin, which really gets at uh, many of the relevant economic and global issues that we confront, namely how to improve capitalism following the global crash of 2008. So without further ado, let's hear Anne speak about the book in conversation. I mean, the timing of this book couldn't be better. Um, and also, as you very kindly mentioned, The Economist, um, you know, we've just expanded and we've created our first China section of the magazine in the last two weeks because we think, you know, the world has a hunger to understand China at the moment. Uh, and Anne's timing, therefore, <laughs> couldn't be better in that sense that there is this appetite with so much changing in China as well as the leadership changes. Um, and also, um, you know, I think there is this general sense in America at the moment that uh, of polarization that people are all shouting at each other and that the, and the, the, the sensible, thoughtful voice in the middle who actually sort of comes at problems with a sort of rational objective eye is getting drowned out. And again, I think it's one of the reasons we should all hope that Anne succeeds with this book because if nothing else, it is a you know, terrific, balanced read trying to make sense of um, the great emerging superpower that is China from a perspective that isn't about China bashing but it's not also uh, full of uh, sort of unstinting praise for China either and so I'm really looking forward to this this conversation Anne is as Rich said someone who really writes what she knows about um, she's been in finance she's been in China a lot of the time her background she's Chinese American so there's a lot we can learn from her and so I just wanted to start Anne by asking you um, you know why did you write this book? Sure, I'm glad you asked that question. I actually get asked that all the time. I, uh, like all of you, love this country. Um, very uh, much concerned, however, about the direction that this country is headed. And this concern actually started uh, back in 2005 when I was still actually working on Wall Street. Back then, I was a credit derivatives trader for a very large multi-billion dollar hedge fund. And it was then that I uh, realized that there were a lot of uh, uh, irregularities going on in the financial markets, specifically a lot of the deals that were coming across my desk uh, had a lot of issues. And uh, this was deeply disconcerting to me. And I had uh, tried to raise it with various regulators here in the United States. But then, uh, became apparent to me that they weren't really going to take any action on this. And that was when I, I guess, started uh, my 
my, I guess, <laughs> entree into political activism in such a way that I started to write about uh, what was going on in Wall Street that, uh, that needed to be reformed. And uh, that was when I decided to leave Wall Street and go into academia, started publishing and lecturing. And uh, my activities brought me to Peking University. I was invited to uh, teach uh, finance and, uh, and economics there. And this was in 2008, just when the credit crisis started to unfold. And because there were very few people in China that understood uh, the structured products market that nearly took down the entire, entire global finance in the world, I was uh, often invited to be consulted to and, uh, and asked about uh, you know, what I thought they should do in regards to how to uh, prepare for uh, the situation that was unfolding. And it was because of all these uh, conversations with a lot of the government officials in China that gave me the insight as to how they were really thinking about their economy and how they approached problems. And I felt that a lot of their ideas made a lot of practical sense that wasn't just relevant in China, but was actually applicable all over the world. And although these two countries are very different, uh, I also know that there are many similarities, and I uh, also believe that people are the same all over the world, because people are motivated by incentives, and, and that is basically uh, what I decided to do, was to collect these ideas that uh, I learned while I was there speaking to these folks, um, and share them with uh, the US, but in fact with uh, anyone in the world that's uh, interested in learning about what was happening in China. And I basically wanted to uh, remind people that, yes, China uh, was somewhat of a basket case uh, just 30 years ago, right? They were still an agrarian society. And so a lot of this story was about their ability to move away from just pure ideology and uh, keep an open mind and to learn from their mistakes and experiment with life and figure out uh, how to improve things. And that was actually what got them on the right track. And I deeply hope that the US uh, would, able, would be able to have the same mindset. And uh, so that was what really inspired me to write the book. So I mean, what's the, the simplest lesson that, that America could learn from China in its, in its current difficulties? Well, I, I talk about a lot of lessons there, but since it's a presidential year, uh, one particularly yeah, relevant one is, that <laughs> is, is the idea of introducing more meritocracy in democracy. Uh, because I think a lot of people don't understand how government is run in China, and I wanted to explain uh, how that happens and, and, and how we can modify certain elements in their government system that uh, could help us improve ours. So in China, uh, no, we I mean, all seriously, know- you're not, you're not advocating going to a more uh, sort of totalitarian sort of system? Absolutely not. <laughs> uh, no, I, there, there is no point in my book where I'm actually advocating any China model per se. Uh, what I do do is that I suggest there are certain best practices in China that I think could be modified and adopted here in a democratic capitalist society. And uh, these various best practices um, are just elements. I'm, I no way ever suggest that we uh, follow their model exactly. And I make it very clear that there are many reforms that China needs to continue to make before they can become a very strong nation too. Okay, we'll get back to the meritocracy. So what, what is it about the meritocracy that we could copy? Yes, so uh, in China, basically, they have a, a government system that is enjoying very high approval ratings from their citizens. Pew Research here in DC uh, has conducted research uh, opinion polls every year uh, for, I don't know, the last decade, and they've uh, reported that 
their government in China enjoys over 80% approval ratings. Now that's something that you know all politicians could only dream of here. Um, but is that is that a real number, or is that just people? Well, it is a real number because the opinion polls. Does, no, because they, they don't take their names. They don't know. You know, there's no reason why uh, they would make up anything. Because if you go to China, you notice that there are uh, Westerners all over the place, um, and and having uh, very widespread debates about all sorts of issues there. So. Uh, uh, so, so anyway, so, so basically, yes, I, I asked the question, why is it that they have enjoyed such a high level legitimacy with their citizens while the U.S. Uh, government officials have such uh, very low approval ratings in, by comparison? Because 60 Minutes reported that uh, Congress has about a 9% approval rating right now. So... So essentially what uh, the Chinese model is, is that it's similar to a corporation. So just like a corporation uh, doesn't elect a CEO to the top position, uh, it's about a, a leader demonstrating over many decades how they are qualified to, uh, be, to be a leader of an institution. And so in order to go work uh, in the central government in China, leaders have to basically first pass a competency test before they can enter government service. And then once they're in uh, government and the competency test is actually very difficult, they then are rotated to different positions uh, for five-year terms and they can't serve any position for more than two terms. And so by the time someone is considered for the top position in China, they would have already served decades in very diverse multiple positions, proving that they have created positive change in their institution. And so uh, this really epitomizes the Chinese belief that the honor to run a country really belongs to someone who's earned the right to do it. So would, you, so would you advocate a competency test here in the US? So yes, so in my book, I uh, suggest that that's an element that maybe we should reintroduce back into our government because we used to have civil service exams for everyone. Today, it's just in the foreign service. And so uh, if we do this and require that policymakers uh, demonstrate some competence and knowledge uh, in their positions, then maybe we won't have the kind of disasters that we saw with Hurricane Katrina Right, because President Bush uh, appointed Michael Brown to uh, head of FEMA, and he didn't have any experience in emergency management. And I mean, would you also apply this to politicians, people running for office? I mean, should you should you have to take a test to, to get on the ballot? Yeah, I think basic, it was basic math and Stanford economics. University that did it, some kind of test that politicians, uh, like fifty percent of them, outrightly failed. Uh, a test on the Constitution that they couldn't even name all three branches of government. And so this is uh, highly disturbing. And so you're talking about people who have enormous power, uh, who don't even have basic facts down. And this is very unusual, really, because if we look at other professions, uh, we see that they often require competency tests, right? Because doctors have to pass medical boards, lawyers have to pass bar exams. Uh, architects have to pass exams to be licensed. And so this is a common thing, and it seems like it's an anomaly that we don't uh, require our uh, policymakers uh, higher standards. And do, you, do you also, I mean, the... You know, it, let's, let's just say we accept the Pew opinion poll numbers as being accurate and that the Chinese people generally do have high degree of confidence in their government. I mean, there is still enormous social unrest and upheaval once you get the sense that the Chinese government is terrified of civil society, of non-profit organizations that are going to organize it. I mean, Falun Gang, you know, their the, the disproportionate reaction to that sort of yes. you know, basically sort of moving about strangely movement that was going on. I mean, it's, it's sort of, you don't set, I mean, what, like 400,000 officially recognized riots in China last year. 
A lot I mean, of so these riots are coming uh, from these protesters against the local government. So I should have made this distinction earlier. The local government people are folks like mayors that run uh, the equivalent of, say, New Rochelle here. And these people don't take competency tests, don't get rotated around to different positions. They actually stay in power for perhaps 40 decades. And that is the source of a lot of corruption in China. And so the central government uh, is trying to figure out a way to uh, get rid of these folks. And therefore, they have introduced elections at the town and village level. But that is where most of these uh, protests and, and riots are happening. And, uh, and so, yes, the Chinese government needs to come up with a viable solution to deal with this problem. Um, I suppose the, the area where, from uh, you know, sort of just general conversation with Americans that have been to China, you know, that, that people feel there is most to learn is that you know, China has these fantastic roads, fantastic infrastructure, uh, great airports, all those things. And there's a sense that in America, you know, bridges are constantly falling down and the roads are always a wreck. And I mean, how, what, what, what can we learn from their, their success in, in building infrastructure? Well, their infrastructure building is, uh, I would say, a result of a couple things. One chapter I talk about is the need for long-term planning, uh, because I think that the U.S. is suffering from a disease called short-termism, uh, where people are just worried about short-term results. We see this with politicians thinking two-year election cycles and corporations managing to short-term Wall Street profits. and uh, and even in our government where we have a lot of entitlement programs, it's really, you know, about immediate expenses and not about building for the future. So China has uh, addressed this te human tendency to want to uh, put short-term band-aids on problems by institutionalizing uh, something called the five-year plan in which it's basically a strategic plan for the nation, uh, which they uh, do for every sector of the economy. And uh, even though it's not law, they treat it like law and take it very seriously. And they put performance targets next to each of these departments so that uh, there are actual um, uh, results that each of these departments have to d uh, deliver to to the government. So for instance, uh, they said in the latest five-year plan that they want to have a greener economy. And so they would attach specific targets there, such as reducing carbon emissions by 17% per GDP unit, or uh, increase building efficiency by 16% per GDP unit. And then they allow the government officials who are responsible for these areas, the autonomy to come up with uh, the right policies to get them there, uh, which is usually a combination of uh, tax hikes on dirty industries, uh, and, you know, grants and other tax incentives for clean tech. And so this way, uh, they will basically have the eye on the long term whereas they're trying to develop clean tech energy while they're still managing for the short term, which obviously they still have pollution problems and they still use a lot of oil and coal, but they are working on them simultaneously. And I make an analogy to the US. I say that you know our closest uh, top-down uh, planning that we have is the OMB, in which uh, they prepare a budget for the United, for the president that outlines his priorities. Uh, the difference is that we don't attach performance targets to any of the departments that receive taxpayer money. So, in essence, it's like uh, all our taxpayer money is going into black holes where uh, they're not required to deliver anything in particular. A as a result, we have trillions of dollars uh, that we've spent, and we still have very high unemployment. Uh, we still have one of the worst healthcare systems in the developed world. And so 
I suggest that perhaps we need to borrow this idea of performance targets uh, and long-term plans as a way to drive more transparency and accountability in government, uh, as a way to counter our tendency just to look for short-term solutions. And do, you, do you think the OMB would be the vehicle for doing that? And it could be one way we can start. Uh, and oftentimes people push back and say, well, you know, how can we possibly do this in a democratic society because politicians get elected or they uh, go out of power and then who's going to uh, watch over these plans? Well, most bureaucrats in, uh, in government, they've been there for decades and they've served, you know, both parties. And generally they're the ones who uh, would be overseeing a lot of the budgets and, 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 and reporting how they've uh, been doing. So... So in essence, uh, they could be the ones responsible for uh, a five-year plan, and the politicians would simply, uh, you know, vote in what sort of results that they would like to see as a result of, you know, whether the agency deserves to exist still if they're not delivering or um, or increase their budgets. So. It would not be a significant departure, I would say. I mean, the, the criticism of, well, one of the, the criticisms of central planning has always been that the people at the center don't really have a clue about what the future holds, and therefore you, know, you don't want to be planning too rigorously because, you know, who knows which way things will move over the next five years. I mean, how, how consistent, I mean, obviously, certain of the five year plans for China have been pretty horrendous in terms of their early. Early right. history. Well, the early five-year plans uh, were different from today's five-year plans because back then it was truly central planning, top-down, everything was run by the government. Today, it's different in that what they're doing, like, as I said, is that it's a, it's a performance uh, goal-setting exercise where uh, they are enlisting the, the talents of hundreds of millions of people around the world to help them get there. So by having... Uh, Around the world. So they go, yes, they, they, because yeah. even many entrepreneurs in the United States uh, will be selling a lot of their products to China as a result of uh, the policies that they put in place uh, via their five-year plan. So I have plenty of friends who are either on boards of clean tech companies or uh, officers of clean tech companies, and they've told me that... China is the only one that's buying their products in clean technology right now. And so this is something where they uh, are attracting the talents of everyone in the world in a way to help them reach their goals. Uh, therefore, it's very different from the planning under Mao where it was uh, very controlled by the government officials and therefore uh, provided more incentives to to fake numbers and so forth, but here it's more about incentives again, and um, so it's 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 operating quite differently. Um, I mean, another criticism that you hear a lot here, and uh, particularly here, um, is that you know China's basically done so well because it's manipulated its currency. Um, is that a fair criticism? I yes, I really take issue with that criticism because one, the historic definition of currency manipulation is when a country depreciates its currency uh, to get a trade advantage. So if we look back at history, uh, the years leading up to World War II were basically when a number of countries went off the gold standard and depreciated their currency drastically to try to gain a trade advantage. Well, when all countries are trying to do the same exact thing, then there was complete volatility in foreign exchange rates, and no business could actually establish any terms of trade because if their costs or their revenues were fluctuating too drastically, there was no ability for them to predict that they could make a profit, and therefore global trade came to a halt. And when... Uh, the Allied nations got together at Bretton Woods, 
uh, to design a whole new financial system, they basically all agreed that they'd never want to repeat this uh, problem again of depreciating exchange rates where each country would try to depreciate their currency. They actually wanted to just have one world currency, uh, but because the United States uh, emerged as the, the sole superpower at the time and uh, did not want that and wanted the US dollar to be the reserve currency, the uh, compromise agreement was that the European nations would all peg their currency to the US dollar and the United States promised to peg the US dollar to gold at $35 an ounce. Now, this whole arrangement uh, worked beautifully for uh, the world because that enabled Germany and Japan and all these countries to grow very rapidly economically because currency rates were stable. It was not until when President Nixon com committed the Nixon shock and unilaterally unpegged the US dollar from gold, and then you had uh, exchange rates that uh, suddenly were fluctuating all over the place, that was actually one motivation for the European nations to form the Euro uh, because they did not want to repeat what happened before World War II. So today with China uh, having had a loose peg to the US dollar, it was actually doing the world a favor by keeping uh, the currency rather stable this way. So they were really not manipulating their currency. When they had set the rate initially, they were using the prevailing rate uh, of 8.28 yuan to the dollar at the time. And this was, I believe, in 1995. And so they were not artificially trying to gain a trade advantage at the time. It was just what all the currency rates were indicating. Uh, and since then, they have appreciated their currency uh, pretty much over 25%. And sometimes if you... Uh, incorporate the effects of inflation, many believe it's been at least an appreciation of 40%. And so the idea of currency manipulator uh, is a complete distortion of what is really happening here. And so I would argue that uh, while people can debate whether China's currency is still too cheap or not, and there's no agreement on what the actual correct uh, exchange rate is, I would argue that that doesn't even matter because the most important thing about a currency is that it is stable. If a currency initially is too low, then the inflation would catch up and it would inflate labor wages, which is what has happened in China. And that would already correct for any advantages they would have. Well, you mentioned wages. Another, another perception is that China, again, has, has thrived by... Um, you know, providing low-cost work and taking jobs that would have been done here and in in Europe. Uh, this is absolutely true. Uh, China has over a billion people, and uh, like I said, just 30 years ago, it was just an agrarian nation, uh, a lot of people with no skills, and so U.S. corporations took advantage of the fact that uh, they could get cheap labor there, and uh, in the you know, recent years, however, wage wages have increased so much in China that uh, it's starting to become very competitive and we've heard of uh, companies moving their operations to cheaper areas. Uh, but China actually wants this to happen because they want to move up the food chain and move into what is called a knowledge economy, uh, which is one that is more based on uh, creativity, of, uh, of using information as a way to uh, power the economy. And so, uh, so, yes, in some ways the labor rates are still cheaper, but it's catching up very rapidly. Um, another trend that we're seeing is that Chinese uh, investors and Chinese companies, you know, sovereign wealth funds and, and also big Chinese brands, I guess Lenovo was the first when it bought IBM, PCs, but they're, they're coming to America, they want to buy American companies, same in Europe. Should we be worried about that, or is that something that you feel good about? Well, I know Americans are always worried about this, uh, but we've had our companies bought by other uh, companies from other nations, and we didn't seem to have a major issue with it. 
uh, it seems more uh, irrational fear, really. Um, and, and, and thus far, many uh, acquisitions have been blocked by our uh, government on national security, uh, for national security reasons, which, frankly, when I speak to friends in government, they say it's, it's really abused because it happens across the board. It has, even when it has nothing to do with national security, they're blocked from buying it. And so, as a result, China has invested in U.S. treasuries instead or uh, bought assets from other countries that are uh, less paranoid than we are. But I think it's a big mistake because uh, why would we be so worried from a nation where they have money to put to work and, uh, and then we need jobs here? And so it would seem like it could be a very symbiotic relationship if... Uh, Americans just put aside some of their irrational fears and, um, and worked with the Chinese on some of these things. So it doesn't bother you that a huge amount of the U.S. deficit is funded by China? Yeah, that's another myth that we all, always hear about, um, that China's US, the U.S. banker. Uh, because the only way that China would ever be the banker of the U.S. is if the U.S. was borrowing in Chinese yuan, but we are actually issuing our debt in US dollars. So the Chinese have absolutely no power over us. If we want to default on our debt, we can just simply keep printing more money. And therefore, uh, China would have no ability to uh, call in the debts. But if we had said we need to borrow in Chinese yuan, and the only way we can get Chinese yuan is by earning it, by working, instead of printing it, then they would be our banker, and then they would have more leverage over us. Okay, one, one last question for me, and then we'll go to, to the audience. Uh, you've, when we talked before tonight about your book, you've said a lot of Chinese Americans have said to you, you know, thank you for speaking out about, about this. What is it that they most appreciate about the book that that they felt wasn't getting a voice in America before you started talking about it? I'm not entirely sure what specifically, because they haven't shared that, but I think there's just a general feeling from many people in the Asian American community uh, across the nation, because I've been on a book tour uh, to uh, many cities now, where I think that there are quite concerned about the, China, the level of China bashing that goes on that seems quite unhealthy. Uh, and I think that, you know, they remembered how this happened with Japan. Um, and, you know, it could lead to uh, unnecessary violence where uh, a Chinese uh, boy was actually murdered because uh, factory workers thought that he was Japanese and so um, beat him up. And this kind of uh, fear-mongering is just really unproductive in a lot of ways because it's not addressing uh, actual policies that we can actually fix. Uh, merely scapegoating a, a nation uh, doesn't really uh, improve our own situation. It only makes matters worse from an international relations standpoint uh, as well as... Uh, you know, wasting our own time in terms of getting economic reforms in place. Okay. Um, gentleman at the front here with the mic's just coming to you. If you just say your name and uh, keep the question fairly brief. Sure. Uh, Ken Siegel. Seems to me the main issue you haven't addressed at all, and that's the issue of uh, human rights abuses, which in China are terrible. I mean, everyone knows about Tiananmen Square uh, during Mao's reign. Uh, tens of millions of Chinese were starved uh, while Mao was selling food to the rest of the world to appear as though China was doing fine in agriculture. So, Anne, what do you, what do you feel about human rights? And, and uh, the freedom. There's no freedom of the press. So you go to China, you got minders following you okay, around. I think they shut down Google. I mean, you didn't touch on human rights in China at all, which almost well, think... seems like you must be a Chinese agent. So it's a nice, friendly start to the questions from the audience. Um, are you a Chinese agent? Can we clear that up first? Um, you know, look at my bank accounts. There's nothing there. I've never been paid by them. Um, 
I Talk understand rights, I understand though. your concern about human rights, and in fact, that always comes up. That's actually not the point of my book. My book basically says that, yes, we understand that China has uh, issues that they need to work on, and we know what they are, but if we only focus on that and ignore what they do right, then you're really missing an opportunity to actually learn something that could actually benefit uh, our own country. And this, this book is about how do we help the US improve itself. So this is not a China human rights book. And so your focus is you know, basically not where I'm trying to, you're missing the message of what I'm trying to convey. But there, but, is, a, there is legitimate critique of China that, and its human rights that... No, absolutely. And I acknowledge that in my book and I don't uh, endorse any of those human rights abuses. And I say very clearly that China needs to change that as well. Uh, but I would say that if we only focus on history and all that, there's no end to it, right? Because the U.S. has had its own issues of human rights. We had Abu Ghraib, we have Guantanamo Bay, we've got uh, a number of, you know, human rights abuses when we go invading, you know, nations and hundreds of thousands of people die as a result. Uh, we even committed genocide against Native American Indians. So if you want to go back in history, then everyone's at fault, right? So we got to look forward into the future and I'm trying to develop a more positive message of, you know, what are the opportunities for both nations to improve. Yeah, the lady there in the second row. Okay. Hi. We'll take your question first and then come back here. Oh, sorry, you're, uh, hi. You're, standing, you're standing up, so we'll let, we'll let you go first and then go to this oh, gentleman over. Uh, go for it. Um, yeah, just related... Just say your name briefly. Sure. Yeah. My name's Liz Nauer. Um, I'm curious about, uh, you talked a little bit about accountability in terms of knowledge for, for leadership. Um, and then in terms of, uh, there's a lot of the discourse and the China bashing. Yeah, could you hold the mic so we can hear it? Oh, okay. A lot of what I, what I hear as, as an educator is about international students coming from China and the, um, the mismatch between a liberal arts education. And you mentioned developing a knowledge economy in China. What do you think in terms of the educational system in China and the educational system here, what, what do you feel are the assets of either of those in terms of economic development in either country? Yeah, I would say that we used to have an excellent educational system and it's deteriorated significantly since then. Um, and there are many reasons for that and uh, I can't go into all of them, but I think one of the main differences is that China addresses education as a holistic way. It's not just the responsibility of teachers, it's the entire society that's responsible. Parents have to instill the right values at an early age. Uh, the government has to be completely behind it in terms of resources. And so this has to be a, a national endeavor uh, to get there. Uh, and China recognizes that you know, the competitiveness of a nation is completely dependent on how talented your, your population is. And so they're doing everything they can to uh, try to ensure that they have the most educated population. And I know recently that uh, their literacy rate just surpassed the US in that sense. And you're talking about, you know, a nation that has four times as many people and came from a much lower base than we did. And so, uh, how do you get there? Well, it is really a cultural value, right? We are not sending the right messages to our young people that education is important. We put on our media constantly uh, shows like um, Jersey Shore where we feature people with very controversial behavior earning millions of dollars and being famous. And this is not uh, encouraging people to go into the sciences. Uh, to go into, you know, other areas that are more productive. And so I even suggested in my book, why don't we uh, provide tax incentives to uh, companies to create shows that would feature the excitement of being an astronomer or a biotech researcher? I mean, there could be very exciting things in terms of making breakthroughs and a lot of people don't have exposure to these professions. And so if we can do that, that in itself would probably uh, be half the battle. 
of, of making education more important in our society. I guess there's Big Bang Theory, but that's doesn't do much for women in education and science, I guess. But um, right, at the, right at the far end, and then the gentleman there. Hi, good evening. Uh, Tristan Zhang here. Uh, thank you for sharing your views tonight. My question is regarding the uh, recent visit of uh, Vice President Xi. As we know, he landed today uh, in the U.S. And um, given that he will be a future uh, power of influence in China, um, a future a central figure of influence, how would you project that his uh, uh, perspectives, you know, his actions, his, his beliefs will impact U.S.-China relations uh, from a political and economical perspective, uh, as, as, as compared to, let's say, uh, Hu, for example. Thank you. Well, I, I've personally never met Xi, so I'm not really sure what his particular agenda is, but I would say that in the Chinese government, uh, the top, uh, pr the president of, the United, uh, of, of China is basically just, you know, the first among equals. Uh, he's never going to make a decision unilaterally. It's going to be pretty much a collective of the standing committee. And given that they've already created a five-year plan from 2011 to 2015, a lot of the agenda is already laid out and quite transparent to the whole world in terms of what their priorities are going to be and how they're going to get there. So, uh, so I'm not going to say that he has no uh, say or influence uh, as a top leader, but I don't think we're going to get any major surprises out of China by a leadership transition. And is I that, think is that, that is that really right? Because I mean, I'm trying to think back to you know Deng Xiaoping after Tiananmen Square. I mean, it seemed like that was his personal call to say let's let's embrace capitalism, or at least there was a clear division amongst the ruling council, and and he he took his his faction at least won that power struggle. And, uh, uh, True. There, and there's a lot of talk now that the the new Politburo is going to be there's going there's a lot more um, variety in terms of the people there. That there's some people who would turn back the clock, some who are very Westernized, some who you know there's been some uh, crackdown on on free enterprise in China in the last year or two that might be continued. So do you not think there's there there are going to be some struggles? These struggles actually have been continuous. <laughs> Just because they have a one-party system doesn't mean that there aren't major disagreements within the one party. Uh, the division between the princelings, which are the largely the more uh, wealthy folks who had uh, parents from with revolutionary backgrounds and who largely grew up along the coastal cities, uh, there's always been a tug of war between those folks and the people in the rural west area, the Trompes. And uh, so they've constantly had to negotiate all their differences about where to spend their resources, uh, you know, what the priorities are, whether it's going to be more government, less government, uh, you know, more free enterprise, less. So this actually has been an ongoing thing. This is not new just to this leadership transition. And uh, the only real difference in this uh, leadership transition is that they're going to be uh, possibly people with backgrounds other than engineering. So in the last few, primarily the backgrounds of the top leaders have had uh, engineering technical backgrounds. And this time, many speculate that uh, there'll be more lawyers, uh, perhaps even entrepreneurs uh, amongst the, the top leaders. And so that would... Uh, introduce the the only uh, difference I would say, but um, but again, I don't think that uh, Xi Jinping is going to do anything surprising. Uh, he's been cultivated over decades. He understands how the party works. He's uh, you know obviously served in many different capacities, and he's going to be you know approaching it uh, at a very conservative and um, and reasonable, uh, rational approach. Uh, and so I don't think that um, we, we're going to have any major surprises. What you uh, pointed out with Deng Xiaoping being a big departure from Mao, that was the one big departure. And since then, uh, it's no longer been a cult of personality. Uh, Mao, who was a dictator then, uh, he was running the show 
pretty much unilateral at the time. But today, it's very much about team leadership, uh, about people earning their way to the top through uh, meritocratic service. And so this has been in place for decades now, and I don't see this changing anytime soon. Okay, so there's a gentleman there with the mic, and then um, we'll go to the lady next to him. Yeah. Um, if uh, China is still per capita much poorer than the U.S., and most of its growth has occurred in the 30 years since Deng Xiaoping, as was suggested earlier, uh, doesn't it seem like the lesson there might be the less planning, the better, the farther you move away from socialism, the better? And for that matter, uh, doesn't a lot of the prosperity occur in places that notoriously ignore Beijing, like the South, and you know, to some extent Shanghai has got special permission, and, you know, they, they sort of ignore Beijing. Wouldn't you be better off learning from Hong Kong or laissez-faire capitalists in general? For that matter, the British, if you think Hong Kong is obviously much more prosperous than the mainland. Well, they are learning to find a balance. I don't think that just free market capitalism works. Uh, obviously, complete government-run uh, situations also don't work. You have to find a balance where the government is uh, setting the rules for an even playing field and then allowing for the genius of you know, millions of people to uh, be able to do its work. And so, yes, uh, China has been rolling back a lot of their government, right? It used to be 100% owned and run by the government. Today, state-owned enterprises is about roughly 40% of the government. And so they've allowed for uh, much more uh, of the private sector to flourish. And, uh, and yes, it is very decentralized. I point out in my book that, yeah, the government, uh, you know, in some ways it's bad because they don't have a strong uh, a regulatory hold on certain things, and so they can't get certain good laws uh, implement in the way they want. But on the other hand, yes, uh, they have a lot of dynamism in the economy because uh, they've, uh, you know, pretty much had more of a, a open free market sort of uh, economy that we had when, uh, when the internet was booming, right? We didn't have a lot of onerous laws in the books for internet because there were none. And therefore, uh, it was the Wild West, and we had millions of uh, companies and jobs created because there was virtually no regulation in this field. And so, yes, it can help, but then once, uh, you know, if it gets uh, abused, then you need to have government, you know, set the rules. Okay, lady next to you. Um, my name's Alice Labrie, and I'm former U.S. Foreign Service, and I've served in Turkey and Oman and... Um, Sweden and the U.S. mission to the U.N. under Richard Holbrook. And I approve somewhat of China's social policies to do with uh, population control. So I'd like to see some of that here, frankly. I live in Harlem. And how is that going? Well, China obviously... You mean the one-child one policy or, yeah? Yeah, I mean, China recognized that they did have a population problem, right? I mean, because they're a continental-sized country, similar in size to the U.S., but then they have four times as many people. Uh, so it's an enormous uh, strain on their resources. Uh, but they also recognize that, you know, they, uh, they probably can't enforce it, in, and, and in many cases, they don't enforce it. In fact, I know plenty of families that have more than one child in China, and they've made plenty of exceptions. So if you're a minority in China, you can have more than one child. Uh, if you came from a one-child family, then you can have more than one child. So there are many exceptions there. Um, you know, I don't know how uh, it's going to play out in the future. I think that they will likely reverse it at some point. Um, as they become wealthier and they figure out ways to uh, deal with a large population and, and, and find ways through innovation to try to feed everyone. But, uh, well, I don't advocate a one-child policy here. Uh, well, I, I, I don't think that necessarily one-child policy would necessarily 
benefit the U.S. in that we don't have a population problem the way they do there. So um, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. Are you asking me if we should have a one-child policy? I think you made it clear that you don't favor a, <laughs> a one-child policy. Let's have the gentleman over the back. You uh, spoke a bit critically of the short-term planning that uh, arises from our uh, two-year election cycles, yet uh, reform thinking seems to have a knee-jerk reaction that what we need is term limits. Perhaps the opposite is true. So I think that when people want and argue for less government in this country, it's because they associate government with corruption and ineffectiveness. And so that's really the heart of what, uh, you know, the heart of the problem. And we need to figure out how do we reverse this perception and how do we reverse the reality of that. And, uh, and so when I suggest that we can have more long-term planning, uh, in fact, that could be uh, a way to drive more credibility in government if government is able to uh, have a long-term vision and meet those goals. Um, and so I think I would disagree. I think what we need to do is figure out ways to drive more transparency and accountability in government. And if we have uh, targets set for when government needs to meet certain objectives, uh, that would actually introduce more credibility to people in government. And so that, in conjunction with a number of other policies I, I talk about in my book, I think uh, would make more sense. Okay, I've got a gentleman there. Uh, one at the back there, we'll take him first. Yeah. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, my name is Uklusha. I'm originally from former Yugoslavia. I have lived in communism and now I live in the free world here. And nonetheless, I believe that freedom is not ideological. Uh, Old countries have flaws. Definitely the US is probably one of the freest countries in the world, but uh, solutions and, and, and problems are global nowadays. And I hope that we don't repeat uh, the mistake that we, as a humanity, did in the past between the USSR and, and the US, where the world will look upon one another as enemies. Uh, my question is about how can both countries found, find common ground. I mean, it's gonna be hard. It's probably the first time in history of humanity that uh, two guys who want to be powerful will collaborate. My question would be about a, a solution because everything in this system, global system, boils down to money. So uh, China, for example, has, I believe, around 67% uh, of the, its reserves in US dollars and they have started uh, diversifying that base. They have started buying euros and uh, actually some other currencies and also materials in Africa, for example. So let's say if we started fighting one another, then definitely China would lose, but the US would lose as well. So okay. well, no, I they think, could, so, yeah, I think we've so got my question. question yeah. Okay, very quickly. One. Okay, my question would be, because I wanted to link it with the, the plan that IOM, uh, IMF has about the currency basket, but is it possible, for example, to make carbon the currency where the Chinese would say, you know what, you have polluted the world for the past 200 years. If you give us the technology, we'll pay you in carbon. Okay, well, I think there's two questions there. The first is, there's this proposal to replace the dollar as the global reserve currency that China has been leading with some kind of basket of currencies that would involve the euro, the one, and the dollar, and so forth. Um, what do you think about that? And the second is, I, I guess is a question about I mean, if we're going to get global agreement on climate change action, it's going to require China and America basically to lead because they are by far the, the greatest um, producers of carbon into the atmosphere. And I guess, um, I guess there's a question around whether we should have any optimism about China doing that. Right. Well, so the first question, uh, whether China would be successful in making a basket of currencies uh, the reserve as opposed to relying on the U.S. dollar. This is a I, proposal for a global reserve currency. Right. Under the IMF. Right. Well, uh, I think the, the devil's really in the details of whether that would work. Uh, a lot of folks argue that can't happen because it's not 
backed by military and so therefore there's no way to enforce certain things. Uh, so I'm not sure how they would design it so that uh, people would stick with it. And um, and its current stage, the US is very much against that. So without US corporation, I don't, I don't know how it would happen. Um, and given that the US has the largest military, you know, bar none, uh, they pretty much can just write the rules. And so, so right now I'm not... Sh Although I I mean, the likelihood is that as China becomes a bigger economy than the US, the, the dollar will cease to be the global reserve currency, just as, as America took over from Britain. The pound ceased to be the global reserve currency. It sort of goes with the weight of the, the world. So the question is whether... Well, it even approach. though, uh, you know, the British Empire started to lose its economic weight, it's still... Uh, carried, you know, the, the pound sterling still was powerful until after World War II, really. So I would say that it's, it, unless you think that we're going to have another world war where that's going to happen, I, I just, <laughs> um, I'm not sure how that transition would happen yet. So uh, regarding the global climate change, yes, it's incredibly important to have China and U.S., and perhaps India and others on the same page. But I think, again, it's very politicized. And while we don't know how, uh, you know, all those conversations, it's hard for us to make judgment calls. But oftentimes, it, like I said, it's always the devils and the details. And so the headline uh, may be, oh, you know, China's not... Uh, cooperating by not signing or the US is not cooperating, it's always usually because of some language in the agreement or the way they see that it's being gamed or that someone is, um, you know, no, getting an I, unfair but, deal. That but, is but basically I mean, the, the point is, though, yeah. that, I mean, surely, you know, you've been talking about China as a long term thinking country compared to America. You know, we all know that in America, you know, politicians don't think beyond the fact that raising the gas price is going to upset everybody um, and they won't get re-elected. But in China, they're supposed to be this sort of great visionary planning and so forth. Are they going to actually address climate change in a more systematic way than America is? Well, I think we're already seeing evidence that they are. Well, I mean, they're so, doing some clean tech, but they're also doing loads and loads of old-fashioned coal power stations. That well, right, because unless you're going to ask them to completely shut down their economy, then of course they're going to still be polluting because there's nothing to replace it immediately. You can't suddenly uh, replace all gas guzzling cars with solar driven cars, right? And so it's going to take time to make that transition. And so I think they're trying to do it as quickly as they can, but uh, they're steering a Titanic. And so as long as they are uh, putting plans in place and are making headway in there. I mean, the solar uh, technology, for instance, used to be 22 times more expensive than dirty technology. And today it's only 20% more expensive. And so I think within two years, it'll be, less, uh, it'll be cheaper than dirty technology completely. And this is because China has put incentives in place for the solar engineers to uh, drive the process engineering uh, to a point where the technology becomes cheaper every single year. And so uh, they're now the solar leader. I think that this is going to happen in many other areas. And so I think that, yes, they're still polluting right now, but uh, you know they can only go so fast. And, uh, and so you know, the U.S. needs to also do its, its, its heavy lifting, too. Okay, the gentleman here. Um Mike's just coming to you. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad you brought up the devils in the details. Um, since China's currency doesn't trade on the open market, does it manage its currency by buying and selling the currencies of its trading partners that do trade on the open market? No. So basically, China has open capital flows when it comes to trade flows. Where they have put gates up is when it's related to capital flows of speculators. So hot money flows 
coming from Wall Street firms are the ones where they're really intervening and, um, and, 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 and managing the currency. And so this uh, push to try to internationalize the yuan in other cities like uh, London and elsewhere uh, is their way of trying to uh, turn the whole idea of foreign currency up on, you know, upside down in that they're allowing people to buy into the currency, but that currency can't come into uh, China and disrupt their economy. But as, in terms of trade flows, that is uh, completely free and open. So if you were a Microsoft or an Intel with operations in China, you can move your capital back and forth uh, as freely as you can here or any other country. It's just the speculative flows that they're most nervous about. And they're not alone in that, in that area. Okay, I just want to check what, how many more questions we had. So we've got a lady here, gentleman there. And we have two more questions over here. And then I think we'll probably wrap up with, with that so that people can buy copies of the book and talk to Anne and get a signature and, and eat some of the food and drink some of the wine. So um, let's start with the lady here and then uh, go that way. Hi. Thank you very much for your talk. My name is Lauren Sinclair. And I have a question about your predictions concerning the next generation of Chinese, well, what are youth now, but what, what do you foresee as their causes for political advocacy and their role in economic development, especially concerning the fact that we we are seeing so many more Chinese students participate in a liberal arts education. Chinese students have, or Chinese youth have so much more mobility and access to the world at large. Um, and, and there's a growing middle class. So how, how do you see these, um, the future generation taking hold of the new China? Well, I think that China is just going to increasingly become a more open society. Uh, but most people that go visit China are pleasantly surprised to see that it feels no different than being here in New York. You know, they import, you know, hundreds of thousands of foreign books into the country every year, more than we do. Uh, they import tens of thousands of magazines and uh, newspapers from other countries as well. And so it's, so they have a very open society already in, in many respects. And I think that with so many of their youths studying abroad, uh, especially in Western schools, it's only going to bring more Western ideas there. And the benefit they have is that they get to integrate the best of the East with the best of the West. My concern here is that in the US, we have far fewer people leaving the country, uh, going abroad and seeing best ideas, best practices elsewhere, and uh, bringing them here and integrating it with what we have to offer and improving our systems. And that is uh, something that I hope will change. Yeah, I remember James Wolfenson at the World Bank showing me this uh uh, this chart showing the number of Chinese students in America compared with the number of American students in China, and it was it said it all really. That there was very little of that outward movement by Americans to learn from that part of the world. But I, just on the point about openness, though, I mean, you, you know, the, the point about Google was made earlier. Um, you know, all those services are censored, aren't they? I mean, do you think that's that's just a temporary phenomena? Well. We actually have our own censoring that goes on here too, right? If someone well. created an Al-Qaeda site, then I'm sure it would be taken down right away. <laughs> so I try to explain in the book how, you Your know, Google, every Googling nation... Googling Tiananmen Square isn't the same as promoting terror. Well, I, they were basically concerned because they felt that there were folks who were um, trying to drum up uh, insurrection or whatever... Uh, using Google accounts. I don't know the details of this, but uh, they treat uh, people who are trying to create instability in the government as, a, as basically as seriously as we treat terrorists. Because uh, if we remember the Cultural Revolution and all the chaos that their society went through is much more recent. Uh, in fact, many people are still living that went through that. And so, uh, 
even though we've had various protests here, it was nothing to the same degree as what China underwent. And therefore, they have that real paranoia about uh, chaos and disorder. And so whenever they uh, feel that there are people who are um, trying to organize these things, and sometimes they think that it's coming from foreign uh, people who are behind it all, then, um, then they crack down on it. And when I asked them about this when I was in China, you know, they make an analogy. They said, well, you know, this may seem like a, a you know, a, 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 I guess an inconvenience not to be able to have a, a, a Gmail account, but Americans go through, uh, you know, body scanners that, you know, are putting x-rays in your body. What a gigantic inconvenience that is. How come people aren't protesting what a violation of privacy and a violation of all these other things that you subject people to here? So, um, so I guess it all depends on your perspective of things. And given that we are not running that country and aren't faced with the kind of problems they're faced with, it's hard to uh, be judgmental about you know, all the, the challenges that they're facing. Okay, we have a question there. Yeah, my, <clears throat> my name is Austin. Um, You're there now. Yeah. All right, my name is Austin. I thank you for sharing your thought tonight. I'm just a little bit skeptical about setting things around conflict. In the recent State of the Union by the President, some of the issues that it discussed had to do with China, uh, where it talked about moving American companies in China back to America. And you know that the greatest challenge to American economy right now is China. And to deal with that, the president has atomized setting proposal, which I think perhaps when seeing the title of this book, I, I, I just have an imagination that, wow, is it possible the president may have had this thought? What can you learn from China? Now, if China resists those policies, those proposals, and say, no, you can't return these companies, we don't want it to go, do you think that there's going to be conflict? Seeing this title from your book is more, I, I just think that this title is political. China My could never tell a American company not to leave. But let's broaden that question slightly to say, you know, do you worry about a trade war with China, given some of the anti-China rhetoric that's being talked? Yeah, I mean, I would almost say that Obama's rhetoric is just pure rhetoric because I haven't seen any evidence of him really putting in major changes in U.S. policy that would encourage companies to come back. Right? We have tax laws there that basically allow corporations to keep their profits overseas without being taxed. And so there's no incentive for them to repatriate their money and invest it here. And given that China is growing so rapidly, why would corporations uh, want to come back here when they can sell more over there? And so there's so many things that uh, are inconsistent. And I even blogged about it in my website recently when after the State of the Union address, and he said, oh, you know, he's talking tough on China about uh, we've got to crack down on the counterfeit goods. Well, I went to look to see what percentage of counterfeit goods was our economy. It was about, you know, $200 million. But our economy is $14 trillion. So where's the beef here? Because he's attacking, you know, just... Uh, cosmetic changes and not really uh, doing, you know, putting in real policies that would make U.S. more competitive. It, you know, if, if the U.S. were able to make our economy more dynamic and more competitive, I think China would be very happy we would do that because they don't want to do all the heavy lifting by themselves, frankly. Uh, the fact that the U.S. is kind of flat on its back, that Europe is flat on its back, it's putting tremendous pressure on the Chinese leaders to pull more rabbits out of the hat. And so if we actually did pull our weight, I think they would actually be happy about that. Okay, then we've got a gentleman here. 
Krishna. Hi, my name is uh, Tom DeLuca, and uh, my question is about this analogy uh, you seem to make earlier in the talk about uh, corporation, uh, as if a political system, particularly a democratic system, should run itself more like a corporation, which seems to me is essentially antithetical to the idea of what a democratic political system should be. And, um, and that comes out more specifically in your discussion of the efficiency and competence of Chinese leaders. Um, and you can correct me on this, uh, but it seemed to me Hu Jintao uh, rising to the top and before him Jiang Zemin were in part because of their ability, uh, uh, perhaps to be uh, efficient leaders in some sense, but also uh, Hu Jintao uh, in Tibet and, uh, and Jiang Zemin in uh, Shanghai to be able to keep a lid on both areas, uh, in, for example, with regard to Shanghai uh, during Tiananmen that in fact this was in, in part the way in which they were viewed to be you know, competent, capable leaders. This is not all that w there was to them, but that was part of why they uh, acceded to leadership, particularly Jiang Zemin. And, um, and so my question is, um, is, don't we really need to separate the question of how do we develop good leadership for a nation, uh, both whether in China and the United States, uh, on the one hand and on the other, how do we develop good leadership for, a, nation, uh, f for a, a political party. So it seems to me China is very good at, uh, at vetting people to be leaders of the Chinese Communist Party, which to some degree works in the interest of the Chinese people and does so in some, t in some ways well, but still in the end, these leaders are being judged by their ability to be good leaders of the Chinese Communist Party. And that's a different thing than becoming a, a good leader of a nation. Well, no, I agree that they're two separate things and the Chinese constitution is such that the party and the government are two separate things, even though today whoever's a, a leader in the party is also a leader of the country. Um, but to your point about uh, finding the best leaders and, and, you know, and whether a, a corporation is antithetical to a democratic system, I would take a broader definition of democracy right because the reason why we have democracy is so that we have a government that represents the best interests of the the society of the common good right because we had monarchy before and that was basically uh you know elites running countries for their own benefit and if we have a situation where the elites can uh take advantage of our system and manipulate it such that uh, the common benefit is lost, then we don't really have a democracy. In fact, many people say that it's no longer one person, one vote here, it's one dollar, one vote, right? So how do we get to a system where we are actually representing the interests of everybody? And when we had uh, a situation where it's about you know direct elections and so forth, and the founding fathers that put this together, it was a very different nation. It was a much smaller country. Uh, it was a much simpler time. You know, today we have, you know, you know, billions of people on Earth. We have very complex systems, and so people don't have the time to go to a town hall and just vote on simple issues anymore, right? People can barely just stay at home and and feed their kids, and so we have to take the realities into account of, you know, who's gonna be looking after the common interest, who has the time and has the, uh, the knowledge and the energy to do all this, and how do we get those people uh, in, in place? So I think this is a very uh, interesting problem that we are faced with uh, in the 21st century. And just like, uh, you know, things basically, uh, you know, replace others when times changed, right? We had the horse buggy uh, stagecoaches, and then when the car was invented, they all disappeared. Well, maybe it's the same with governance too, right? Maybe what worked uh, hundreds of years ago really needs a facelift now. And so uh, this is obviously a philosophical question. It's a question of, you know, everyone should be having about how do we uh, get to a system that works for everyone? I think too often we are so conditioned to think democracy is obviously the best system, but it's just the soundbite 
And when we look around and it's not working for so many people, then we have to basically look at the results and question, well, then how do we fix this? And not just assume that it's, it's the perfect system at, for all times. So I'm not suggesting that China's system is necessarily better than ours. Uh, I actually suggest that maybe the best system haven't, hasn't been invented yet and that we need to start figuring out a way to get there. Okay, and then we've got the very last question right at the back there. Yes, David Kirschman. Thank you for coming this evening. We really appreciate it. A uh, very strict uh, management question. How, and we had touched on it before, and you mentioned about the transparency uh, that the United States government can learn by what China does and reporting and using real-world metrics and uh, the old-fashioned business management tools. How, how would you address, then, if, uh, if government was to implement these cost-saving ideas and streamlining government and uh, the tools of management without driving up human capital to do these things? In other words, the processing of paperwork and, and so forth, uh, goals, missions, uh, missions and goals, just like private sector, uh, would that increase human capital to drive these things or uh, it would be another outcome? And what examples have you noticed from China, what they do as far as uh, efficiency and actual projects and outcomes and so forth? Sure. I pretty much think that the way to do this is just to do it in small versions all over the place and then figure out the best way to get there. So in one of my chapters titled Special Economic Zones, I talk about China's ability to uh, engage in systematic experimentation of all kinds of policies, uh, whether they be economic policies or other social policies. But they would test it out first in a province or maybe some major city. And then they would have uh, independent objective observers come and see whether that policy is having the intended effect. They invite you know, outside academics and others. And then once they have the results, they could then say, well, this is working or not working. And if it's not working, how do we tweak it to make it work? And then run another test. So in a way, they've turned economics into one giant lab experiment. And, and I think that is actually something that the US can learn, because we had uh, 50 states that were called laboratories of democracy. Why don't we turn them into laboratories of economic opportunity, where uh, we can try out different things, and in, in, in you know maybe multiple states simultaneously before we roll out something for the entire nation? Because today, so much of our policy making is just based on uh, rhetoric and ideology, and uh, and just horse trading in Congress. Uh, it's not really based on real results. And so if we could actually try to get it done in small places and, and maybe we just try out five-year planning in maybe you know, a couple states and see what happens and then they can share their uh, findings with others and then learn from each other that way, we might be able to get uh, something uh, you know, just as effective as what they have. Great, and uh, just to finish, I mean, um we talked about what the USA can learn from China. Is there one? Th what, what would be the number one thing you would say that China could learn from America? Yeah, I uh, had a number of things, but if I were just to pick one, I would suggest that they could learn better public relations, because I think that the United States is uh, extremely talented in sales and public relations. Here, uh, the Chinese, on the other hand, are uh, terrible at communicating uh, to the West about what their intentions are and what they're accomplishing. And in part, this is cultural because a lot of the Chinese have grown up with uh, the, the idea that actions speak louder than words. And so these people think that if they're doing good, then it should be obvious. They don't need to actually go out and beat their chest and tell the whole world. Uh, unfortunately, Oftentimes it gets misinterpreted or uh, it gets uh, changed to fit other uh, convenient political agendas. And so then uh, what they're doing doesn't get communicated the way they want it to. And so I think that's an area that they can definitely learn from the U.S. 
Great. Well, look, Anne, this, you've covered a vast amount of um, really interesting territory, and uh, I know in the book there's even more uh, interesting stuff and thought-provoking stuff, so um, I hope everyone will buy a copy and recommend it to their friends and so forth. And uh, and just, you mentioned your website. What's the address of the website? Oh, it's professoranlee.com as one word. And then you tweet as... Ann Lee says. Ann Lee says, great. And um, I tweet as at Matt Bish, M-A-T-T-B-I-S-H, if anyone wants to follow me on that one. But uh, And big thank you, and good luck with the book. <laughs>